The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a collaborative project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies and the International House Global Voices Program. Our nationally recognized programming is made possible with support from listeners like you. Secure the future of World Beyond the Headlines programming by making your gift online at alumniservices.uchicago.edu slash giving. Please specify World Beyond the Headlines as the area of giving. The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is supported by the McCormick Foundation, the Norman Wade Harris Fund, and generous contributions from listeners like you. Well, thank you very much. It's a wonderful audience. Joe, if you look back, it goes all the way upstairs also, so it's quite, it's quite a, a big group. Uh, this is the book. Hope you'll all buy it and get it signed. Um, it's really a great pleasure and a great honor uh, to welcome Professor Stiglitz to the University of Chicago. We go back a long way, as was suggested. Uh, we were colleagues in the same department. We shared graduate students. We shared wine sometimes. We shared meals. Joe's actually quite a good cook. Joe always was not so well organized. So there were times when you'd be over at his house. I remember one dinner party, and I don't know whether you remember this, and right in the just as he was beginning to cook, there was a call from the people who control the electricity, and they said, your bill, your bill is overdue. <laughs> and there were threats that this would close down, but uh, he handled it with great charm and great aplomb, and the check was in the mail, and, and we had a wonderful dinner. Uh, Joe is a remarkable human being, brilliant, formidable, charming, warm, and actually, in Beth's words, Beth will be here later, she's babysitting, irresistible. Post-World War II scene in economics was dominated by three great figures, great economists. Paul Samuelson, who recently passed away, was an undergraduate at the University of Chicago before he continued his education at Harvard. He was Joe's advisor at MIT, where he spent his career. Also from Gary, as is Joe. Milton Friedman, who passed away two or three years ago, PhD from the University of Chicago, did his great work here. And Kenneth Arrow, uh, who's still with us, um, and some of his most notable work was in fact done at the University of Chicago when the Coles Foundation uh, was here. Um, continued at Stanford, short break at Harvard, and is back at Stanford now. All three were Nobel laureates. All three defined the agenda for economics. All three were prodigious in their output of Nobel laureate students. All three had fierce intellects and amazing breadth. They were giants. And all three had enormous influence on how we live, not just economic thought, but economic policy. They really defined an awful lot of what we are today. All three deserve the title economic philosopher in the best sense. And they consider deeply the relationship between economic system, freedom, democracy, poverty, education, where we're heading, where the world is heading. Joe Stiglitz, or Super Joe, as we uh, often called him, is at the top of the small group of people that succeeded these three during the last quarter of the last century and continuing today. I don't know who the other two or three are or five are, but I know that he would be on everybody's list for that kind of acclaim and honor. Born in Gary, raised in Gary, but you're born in Gary too, right? Um, went to Amherst College with a full scholarship, spent three years there, and they decided it was time to ship him to MIT, um, where he finished in two years. Um, a major influence during the time when he was at MIT, especially during the summers, was Hiro Ozawa, a great friend of both of ours, who um, uh, was at the University of Chicago, actually, during those years, came here from Stanford and then returned to Japan. Uh, and then Joe quickly went to Yale. He must have 
become a full professor two years later or something like that, and then Stanford, and then Oxford, and then Stanford, I think, and then Princeton, so he's been almost as peripatetic as me. Um, Joe's never satisfied with the standard model, and he has the intellect, the technical abilities, and the ambition to change the game, and change the game he has. Brilliant, provocative, at a time when one is unsure about the proper role of government, unsure of the way forward, Joe Stiglitz is a voice that must be heard. The indictment is strong. I read a couple of sentences. We have altered not only our institutions, encouraging ever-increased concentration in finance, but the very rules of capitalism. We've announced that for favored institution, institutions, there is to be little or no market discipline. We've created an ersatz capitalism with unclear rules, but with a predictable outcome. Future crises, undue risk-taking at the public expense. No matter what the promise of a new regulatory regime and greater inefficiency. We have lectured about the importance of transparency, but we've given the banks greater scope for manipulating their books. In earlier crises, there was worry about moral hazard, the adverse incentives provided by bailouts. But the magnitude of this crisis has given new meaning to the concept of moral hazard. Big indictment, big program, but Joe's a great optimist, and he has both words about how we got there and some suggestions for how we go forward. Joe. Well, thank you, Hugo, for that very nice introduction. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, story here is a, uh, what I want to do is begin first with, with how we got into uh, the current mess. Uh, and and th thinking about that uh, is a little bit like peeling back the onion because there are a lot of a lot of uh, people trying to uh, uh, no one wants to claim blame uh, trying to uh, 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 put blame on others. Uh, the uh, the bank said we didn't do anything wrong. Uh, there was a once in a hundred year flood, uh, a tsunami, and it just happened. Uh, but as uh, I'll try to explain, uh, it didn't just happen. Uh, they created the problem. It wasn't something that happened to them. It's something they did to us. Uh, the, there are other views that say, well, there was just a little bit of a, of a problem. Uh, the plumbing got clogged. And uh, when you have plumbing that's clogged, you, you call in the same plumber that put in your bad pipes in the first place. Uh, and you know that he's going to overcharge you. Uh, and you know that he's not going to really fix it, but you have no choice because he's the only one who knows where the kinks in the plumbing are, so you're, you're in a bind. Um, and that's what, in fact, we did. We called in some of the same plumbers, the people who made the same mistakes that created the problems. Uh, but the fact is it's not just uh, a little problem of plumbing where you have to get uh, the plumbing unclogged. Um, you know, one of the themes, the theses of the, of, of the book is that there is actually something uh, fundamentally wrong. But a number of players were, played a role, uh, the financial sector, the regulators, um, and, it's, uh, and the economist. Uh, and and it's try, it's a, a part of the task of the book was to try to uh, parse out blame and, and uh, to... to uh, if you're going to figure out what we ought to do going forward, we have to know what went wrong. And that's why I begin the book by talking about what went wrong. Uh, well, when thinking about it that way, uh, I put blame at the center at the banks. Um, they, they have a, finance is very important. I want to make it very clear. I, I really do think that uh, it, it, no well-functioning economy can do without a financial market. And that's why it's so important that they do what they're supposed to do, uh, do it well. Uh, they're supposed to do a, a couple of things. Uh, manage risk, allocate capital, run a payments mechanism, and to do it all tra low transaction costs. Uh, they misallocated capital. 
Uh, probably no government has ever wasted as much money if America's financial system has wasted in the last few years, then total cost will be in the trillions of dollars. Uh, they didn't manage risk, they, they actually created risk. Uh, they created risk in ways that put in jeopardy our entire payments mechanism. And instead of doing all of this at very low transaction costs, the, the transaction costs were huge. 40% of all corporate profits before the crisis were in, uh, in the financial sector. So we really made a fundamental mistake. We, we confused ends with means. We thought that the financial se sector was an end in itself, when it's really a means to making the rest of the economy more efficient and managing risk. And if it do, do, does its job well, it accrues a portion of the increment to uh, the performance of the economy as its, you might say, just rewards. But uh, our financial system didn't do what it was supposed to do and yet got uh, very well rewarded. Well, that's not the way markets are supposed to behave. And so the natural question that an economist would ask is, why did it? perform so badly? And the natural answer to that, and economist uh, answer, is incentives. Uh, the one thing economists agree on, I think it's the one thing, I, I always feel nervous in saying that, and, uh, is that incentives matter. And if you look at the details of the incentive structures in the financial sector, they had incentives for excessive risk taking and short-sighted behavior. Uh, in the years, uh, before the crisis, I was a little bit worried because my analysis of what those incentive structures should have done was that it should lead to all kinds of disasters. And so I was a little worried that we weren't having the disasters that the theory predicted. Uh, but now I can feel relieved uh, <laughs> that, in fact, uh, the economic theory does not have to be rewritten. In fact, they behave the way that uh, uh, incentives uh, said that they uh, should behave. But that doesn't end the, the, the inquiry, because you have to ask, uh, you know, why do they have bad incentives? You know, one of the things we pride ourselves about the market economy is that it figures out what are good incentive systems. That's part of the thing that it's supposed to figure out. And yet, it didn't do this. And the question, again, is why? Well, part of the answer to that is, is uh, uh, an issue that's called broadly corporate governance. 21st century capitalism is very different from 19th century capitalism. 19th century capitalism, the model that we have in mind is a, a, a owner-operated firm where if you own your firm, you make a mistake, you, 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 the, the, you bear the consequence of the mistake. In 21st century capitalism, there's a very big separation between ownership and control. The guys making the decision did very well by what happened. They walked off with hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, but the shareholders and the bondholders haven't done very well. So uh, economists refer to this as the problem of agency, um, the, the fact that uh, those running the firms are running it on behalf of others, and there's not a, a, an alignment of interests. Well, uh, all of these problems uh, and some more were, were in a sense, uh, uh, recognized, and, and in fact, We've had crises, financial crises, over and over and over again. In fact, we've had bailouts over and over and over again. There's only been a short period in the history of capitalism when there have not been financial crises. And that is the short period, uh, 30, 40 years after the Great Depression, when we adopted strong financial regulations and the whole world actually uh, uh, avoided uh, with one or two exceptions, a financial crisis for more than a quarter of a century. But then we forgot history. We forgot what had happened repeatedly over and over again. And so we began the process of stripping away the regulations that had, in fact, protected us. Uh, we should have realized the problems that I just described. We should have realized that uh, if banks undertook excessive risk, and they failed, there would be consequences for others, and a concept that economists call it externalities. Uh, 
Uh, and that's one of the important reasons why you need regulation. But unfortunately, we appointed regulators who didn't believe in regulation. So we were both stripping away regulations, we were not adopting new regulations to reflect the new uh, innovations in the financial markets, and we were appointing regulators who didn't believe in regulations. And again, you have to ask the question, why was that? And there are two answers that come uh, to the fore. Uh, one of them is special interest. There are a lot of people making a lot of money out of this new system. And uh, they were uh, uh, wanted to keep it that way. And right now, they want, to keep, want us to go back to the world that we had before the crisis, back to the world of, uh, of 2007. Uh, the financial sector may have invested financial capital on, the uh, on behalf of others very poorly but they invested their political capital very well. And uh, they've gotten, uh, demanded a high return and they've gotten it. They, they first uh, got uh, deregulation uh, and then later on, if I have time, I'll talk a little bit about how they got a bailout that gave them a lot of money but didn't succeed in doing what it was supposed to do. And now they are successfully resisting uh, a, a, rest a restoration of an appropriate regulatory structure. So uh, that's one pretty obvious uh, uh, um, that these special interests uh, played a, a very important role. Uh, but there's another factor, and that is ideas. Uh, the uh, ideas that that markets were, were that that regulation was unneeded, that markets would take care of themselves, and. Uh, this is where I think uh, economists have to play some, uh, take some culpability for what has happened because they help provide the regulators, the politicians, uh, the general populace with, with a set of ideas that help shape public policy over a long period of time, shape public policy to say that we don't need regulations, we don't need, we, we, we ought to have regulators who don't want uh, uh, who, who think, no, who realize, who are smart enough uh, to realize that we don't need regulation. Uh, I, I should perhaps uh, uh, tease a little bit uh, uh, Hugo about the name of his uh, professorship, because the uh, his Adam Smith professor and the the idea, the big idea behind all of this was uh, that of Adam Smith, who argued that. Uh, uh, the pursuit of self-interest uh, leagues as if by an invisible hand to the general well-being of society. Now, I should point out, uh, Adam Smith understood the limitations of that, and uh, the, uh, uh, one of the people that, that uh, Hugo referred to, uh, uh, Ken Arrow, one of his great contributions was to... Uh, uh, identify the circumstances under which that and the sense in which th that result was correct. And uh, there were very strong limitations. Uh, very, it, it was not in general true. The interesting thing is that result was an inconvenient result. Uh, and so those who wanted to believe in free markets did not pay attention to Ken Arrow, who understood the limitations of markets, and went back to a simplistic interpretation of of Adam Smith. Well, my own work, one of the areas of my own research, an area actually related to my Nobel Prize, uh, was related to the problems that arise when there is imperfect and in particular asymmetric information. Asymmetric information just is a simple idea that, that some people know something that other people don't know. Uh, and the fact that uh, uh, that is true should be obvious. Universities wouldn't exist if we didn't have something to teach uh, if you knew everything that we knew, we couldn't. Uh, uh, we, we wouldn't have a job. So, so asymmetric information is is at the core of a university, but it's also at the center of, of financial markets and, and most other uh, other markets. And uh, to put it in a, in a simple way, one of the key results of my research was to show uh, a, a work I did with a colleague at Columbia called Bruce Greenwald. Uh, our results showed that the reason. Uh, that the invisible hand often seemed invisible was that it's not there. Uh, 
That is to say that uh, and, 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 and we've just gotten a wonderful demonstration of that. I don't think anybody would claim that the banker's pursuit of their self-interest, which is more commonly called greed, has led to the well-being of our society. Uh, and I'd like to have somebody come forward and try to explain how that is the case, but I don't think anybody would. So in a sense, we've had a real-life demonstration of the fact that Adam Smith was, in this particular case, wrong. Well, uh, that was one of the, you might say, flawed ideas that really helped provide the underpinning for the deregulation movement and for, for much of else uh, that, that uh, uh, led to the, the crisis. There's another idea I want to mention just very briefly, which is an idea that, that uh, is very strongly associated with this university, which is called the efficient markets hypothesis, uh, that uh, uh, markets uh, are efficient not only in the sense that Adam Smith talked about it, but in an informational sense. That is to say that they efficiently transmit information from one person to another, from the uninformed to the, from the informed to the uninformed. Uh, this is idea is, is a is a, a very powerful uh, idea, um, but it's it's wrong. <laughs> And uh, uh, there are many ways in which you could explain the sense of which is wrong, but one that I, I found very interesting, you know, that I wrote about, uh, actually, uh, it's almost 30 years ago, uh, is a very simple idea. If markets were efficient, then nobody would have incentives to gather information, because anybody who gathered the information the benefit of that information would be instantaneously transmitted to everybody else. And so if markets were efficient, then the only information that anybody would invest in gathering would be information that was costless. So the system might be informationally inefficient, but it would be informationally devoid. Uh, so it would not, that you, you could not say the system was a, a well-functioning system. That in fact, that there was, we argued, this is a work I did with Sandy Grossman, who did his, P, his PhD here at uh, Chicago, uh, was that that there was an equilibrium uh, amount of disequilibrium, uh, an equilibrium amount of, uh, of imperfect information. Well, again, this crisis has provided uh, innumerable examples of where markets uh, cannot be described as efficient in any reasonable sense, in fact, uh, in many cases, you can only describe the behavior not as efficient, but as stupid, um, to use the colloquialism. Um, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, the, what one of the core parts underneath the crisis, and, and the simple story uh, of the crisis begins there, is that we had a bubble. Uh, and what fed the bubble, uh, what, 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 uh, 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 but the bubble was, was that people were, uh, the banks were keeping making loans on the basis of rising values, and the fact that rising values meant that they were willing to make more and more loans, and in fact increased the loan to value ratio. And you had these prices going up and up, and, and many of us were saying, uh, this is not sustainable. And uh, one of the, my predecessors as chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors once said, that which is not sustainable won't be sustained. Uh, and that was, in fact, uh, the case. Uh, how could it be that house prices were going up and up when most Americans' incomes were stagnating or going down? And this is something that many people don't uh, really fully appreciate, but median income, the people in the middle, half above, half below, median income in the United States has been going down year after year for, for a, a decade, and some statistics even longer. So uh, median income in 2008 was 4% lower adjusted for inflation than in 2000, and things have gotten worse since uh, the, the crisis. Um, so it was inevitable, you know, you don't have to have a PhD to figure out people can't spend more than 100% of their income in housing. And if housing prices keep going up, uh, there was going to be a problem. Temporarily, uh, 
we didn't have a problem because interest rates were very low. They were down at 1%. But that had historically had never been the case. And we would uh, eventually have house interest rates go up. And when they went up, we would face uh, a serious problem. Now, uh, that sort of illustrates, uh, it brings me to, a, to uh, uh, an example of where even those who were supposed to be understanding risk either didn't understand it or had interest not to understand it. Obvious candidate of this is Alan Greenspan, the chairman of the Federal Reserve. When he was asked whether we had a bubble, he said, no, 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 we just have a little froth uh, in our economy. But in fact, it's worse than that because he gave a speech in which he encouraged people to take out these variable rate mortgages, mortgages where the interest rate that you pay could go up when the interest rate goes up. And what he said, and it's important to realize, that here is somebody who alleged, allegedly believed in the efficient markets hypothesis, believes that markets were efficient, and that's one of the reasons why he said there could not be a, a bubble, and, and therefore we don't have to do anything about it. So he, he gave a speech in which he encouraged people to take out variable rate mortgages, saying that if they had done that 10 years earlier, they would have saved a lot of money. Now, that is true that they had done it 10 years earlier. And the reason that that was true was that markets are forward-looking and look at the statistical average, and no one had ever brought interest rates down to 1%, which is something that he did. So he, brought, he broke the normal statistical pattern brought them down to low levels, and then he said, well, look, if people were, uh, would have been smart if they had bet on my doing, which nobody else had ever done. But when interest rates are 1%, what is the likely direction in which they're going to go? <laughs> Almost surely, they're going to go up. They're not going to go much down. You can be sure of that. So if he's encouraging them to take out a variable rate mortgage when the mortgage rates are 1%, what he's telling them is take out something where almost surely you're going to have to pay more, a higher interest rate within the next few years. And if they've taken out a mortgage, which is at the limits of their ability to pay, that means they're going to have some problems. And if they and everybody else start having problems simultaneously, what's going to happen? when they uh, need to go and re, re, uh, uh, to, to, to renew their mortgage, they're not going to be able to get it. Or if they want to sell their house, nobody else is going to be able to buy it. When they all try to sell their house or try and finance at the same time, prices are going to go down, and then the bubble will break and uh, we'll be in a mess. And that's exactly uh, what happened. But intellectually, the problem of uh, Greenspan was even deeper, and I'm uh, not picking on him particularly, because he, he was at the top. Everybody else was reflecting the same kind of mindset. Somebody who believes in the efficient markets would never say you would do better by buying a variable rate or a fixed rate mortgage on average. On average, markets would make these two exactly equivalent. And he should have understood that. And those selling the mortgages should have understood that. What's the difference between the two mortgages? Only risk. That one mortgage, you know, a fixed rate mortgage versus a variable rate mortgage, on average, you're going to pay the same amount, but there's different risk. And which one has the greater risk? Obviously, the variable rate mortgage, because you don't know how much you're going to have to pay. If interest rates go up, you'll pay more, and you may not be able to afford it. So. What's so interesting about this and why I'm emphasizing it, it shows the kind of cognitive dissonance that was very pervasive in the financial markets. And there were you know, lots of other stories that I could go through of, of examples where uh, they, they really uh, held two contrary positions at, at the same time. Let me just give you uh, one uh, other example uh, of that. Uh, and that's uh, the credit default swaps, uh, the, the derivatives, these risky, Warren Buffett is called financial we map weapons of mass destruction, which actually proved to be the case. Um, they, 
One of the, you probably have seen statistics where the numbers of these outstanding were in the trillions of dollars. And the reason that they got so large is if A bet B something would happen, uh, and then he's decided, no, let's undo the bet, rather than canceling the bet, uh, they said, well, we'll get more fees if instead of doing that, B will bet A on the same thing. So A betting B and B betting A on the same thing cancels. And so it's an elementary thing if you know a little bit of uh, math. You know, you know, a plus and a minus adds up to zero. So, so that's what they, they, they got that. They've taken that part of the course. Um, but they had forgotten one part of the economics, which is if A owes B and A goes bankrupt, then A doesn't owe B. But B still owes A. So these things don't cancel. So you ask them, now why didn't you net these things out? You know, because you, uh, you're exposing yourself enormously to this kind of uh, risk. And you get back an answer, well, uh, none of these firms are ever going to go bankrupt. And then you look at the product that they're selling. What is the product? Their bets on these banks going bankrupt. So the whole market was on betting on banks going bankrupt, and yet they were saying no bank would go bankrupt. Now, uh, that takes a kind of cognitive dissonance that I think is, is quite impressive. Um, one other aspect I'll just mention of uh, uh, the context of university, it's important to understand the, the role of ideas in, in this whole crisis. Securitization was an idea that, that uh, Labor, you know, was very important. The fact that the banks could sell off their loans to others played a very important role in the crisis. In the old-fashioned banking, a bank would make a loan. If it made a bad loan, it bore the consequence. In modern securitization, uh, it was based on uh, uh, what I call the greater fool theory. Uh, you uh, create a, a mortgage, and then you look around for somebody stupid enough to buy it from you. And globalization had work, opened up a, a global marketplace for fools. And uh, our banks were very good at marketing, even if they weren't very good at risk assessment. And we sold about 40% of our mortgages to Europe. So when I'm in Europe, I always thank them for buying our, mortgage, our toxic products, because if they hadn't, the downturn in the United States would have been much worse uh, than, it, than it already is. Well, Securitization was based on a very simple idea that uh, goes back actually to another Nobel Prize winner, uh, Markowitz and Tobin, who talked about the virtues of diversification. And so when I talk, lecture my students about securitization, I talk about that. That's the first lecture. And I somehow feel that sometimes I feel a little guilty because after that first lecture, they all ran down to Wall Street to make money, and they didn't listen to the second uh, and third lecture. Uh, <laughs> The second lecture points out that this doesn't work so well if there's high correlation. That is to say, if all these uh, securities, all these mortgages go bad at the same time. And that's going to happen if interest rates go up, if we have a recession. And so uh, that's actually what happened. So they thought they were much more diversified than they really were. But the third uh, lecture that they didn't go to was uh, on uh, information asymmetry. Securitization opens up opportunities for these information asymmetries. Uh, the people buying the mortgage didn't know the details of the mortgages that they were buying. Um, and uh, you know, it, how could they? Some of the complicated products, the CDO squares, for instance, underlying one of those securities, there were more than uh, a million individual mortgages. So if you spent your time figuring out those mortgages, you wouldn't have time to eat or sleep or do anything else in your life. Uh, so there was no way that you could become informed about these products. So the, the problems of information asymmetries were, were uh, enormous. But here comes another uh, you know, aspect of, say, cognitive dissonance. Um, they in assessing the risk of these complex products, they used past data. Now, they argued that they had transformed the world. Uh, and that was why they deserved such high salaries. 
But if they had, in fact, transformed the world, then the data of the past 20 years or 10 years was not relevant for these particular securities. So why can you use them? In fact, they had transformed the world, but for the worse. Uh, and the data was not relevant because the probabilities of default were much, much higher. If you create mortgages called liar mortgages where you encourage people to lie about their income and about the value of the properties, of course you're going to get high default rates. If you give loan-to-value ratios of 100%, of course you're going to get high default rates. So um, they should have understood that uh, the world, that they had changed the world before the worst, and therefore the data that they were using was totally invalid. Well, the reason why I've dwelled on this is that, in fact, these are all examples of how ideas played an important role in the crisis, but there was really a lack of depth of thinking, and unfortunately, much of that problem still persists. I want to spend just one minute talking about how these got reflected in policy uh, during the run-up to the crisis. Uh, and unfortunately, again, thinking hasn't changed uh, uh, as much as it should. Uh, I mentioned before that it seemed to me clear that there was a bubble. But those running our monetary policy, Greenspan, Bernanke, believed that it was impossible for there to be a bubble because efficient markets would not allow it, and markets were efficient. So bubbles could not exist. Then they went on to say, well, even if it existed, you can't really tell it until after it breaks. Now, of course, you can't be sure until after it breaks, but you can be pretty sure. And all policymaking is done under uncertainty, and good policymaking means that it has the probability, the confidence that there is going to be uh, um, uh, a, a, that there is a bubble and it's going to break, you ought to, you ought to take stronger and stronger actions. Uh, but they pretended that it's either, either you know it or you don't know it. And since they weren't sure, they decided to do nothing. Thirdly, they said, even if we could detect it, we don't have instruments. But they had instruments. Congress had given them instruments to do it. They chose not to do those instruments because they said, we don't want to interfere with the market. But the very, what's so ironic here is the Fed is an interference with the market. It's setting one of the most important prices in the economy, which is the interest rate. And finally, they said, it's much less expensive to clean up the mess than to risk interfering with the wonders of the market. I don't think anybody would say that today. Uh, the cost of cleaning up this mess is in the trillions. Well, I want to spend the last few minutes uh, talking about where, where do we go, um, uh, where are we, and where do we go. Well, let me first say uh, we're not in great shape. We're not out of the woods. We, we've stopped the free fall, uh, uh, but the best way to see where we are is to look at the labor market more than one out of six Americans who would like a full-time job cannot get one now. And if you look at specific demographic groups, uh, the problems are even worse. Um, un youth unemployment among Afro-Americans is now almost one out of two. Uh, uh, unemployment, official unemployment rate among males uh, uh, in key working age uh, is uh, 20%. Um, so you look at the various statistics, we, you, you see, and you look at particular parts of the country, you see uh, how bad uh, the economic situation is. Uh, I mentioned the beginning of the uh, crisis ha had to do with mortgages. Um, one out of four mortgages are underwater. That means people have negative equity. For most Americans, their home is their only asset, and now one out of four of these, and particularly a large fraction of these are poor Americans, have no equity in their home. They've lost their life savings. Uh, we expect this year between two and a half and three and a half million Americans will lose their homes, more than in 2009 and more than in 2008. So we have a social problem. That the system isn't working very well should be evident in the following sense, we have a situation where we have vacant homes and homeless people. We have a world in which we have uh, 
all kinds of unmet needs, uh, retrofitting the world for global warming, uh, billions of people in poverty, and yet we have excess supply, underutilized resources. Uh, so to me, uh, this talk about recovery is, is clearly premature. Um, it'll be even uh, official forecast, say it'll be the middle of the decade before the unemployment rate gets back to normal, uh, unless we do something much more dramatic. So uh, what is it that we've done and what is it that we need to do? Well, the three areas. First, the stimulus. This is, about, this is the one-year anniversary of the stimulus. A lot of controversy about it. The stimulus did make a difference. I think it made a big difference. But it was too small, and it was not as well designed as it could have been. Uh, part of the reason it was too small is the administration, which involves some people who were obviously involved in the creation of the crisis, uh, were overly optimistic. They didn't want to admit the magnitude of the mistake that had been made. And so they thought the unemployment was going to peak at around 10 percent without the stimulus, and with the stimulus it would be down to about 8 percent. The problem is the downturn was worse. Uh, the unemployment would have probably been around 12 percent. The stimulus brought it down to 10 percent. But obviously, 10 percent should be viewed as unacceptable. Uh, I think we need a second stimulus, more focusing uh, on the creation of jobs. The second area, mortgages. Um, uh, nothing was done uh, in the previous administration. But unfortunately, again, too little was done in this administration. Nothing was done about the critical problem of mortgages that were underwater. Again, obvious reason. The banks did not want to recognize the fact that they had made bad loans. And they um, succeeded in getting a change in the accounting standards so that they could keep on their books at full value loans that were not even being repaid. And the myth that sometime years from now they'll be repaid. So if you had forced the banks to restructure the loans, they would have to recognize the loss and they, the, 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 the problems in the banking sector would become evident. So the administration did nothing about these mortgages that should have been restructured. And that's why we are continuing with this onslaught of mortgage foreclosures. The final area is doing something, doing something about the banks, re-regulating the banks. Let me say very clearly, right now the problems are worse in many ways than they were in 2007. Because what we did is we pumped money into the big banks, the banks that were too big to fail. We allowed those banks to consolidate, to merge. And so the problems of too big to bank the too big to fail banks has become even worse. Uh, meanwhile, last year alone, we let 140 small banks go bankrupt. And these smaller banks tend to be the banks that actually provide loans to small and medium sized enterprises, actually fulfill the kinds of functions that we need a financial sector for. Things are worse for another reason because uh, the problem of moral hazard has become much worse. Uh, we almost surely had to bail out the banks, but we didn't have to bail out the bankers, the shareholders, the bondholders. And because of that and because of the way we did it, uh, the bank bailout didn't succeed in doing what it was supposed to do, which was rekindle lending, and the national debt is much higher than it otherwise would have been. Well. Uh, the financial sector is, has been very successful, not surprisingly, resisting so far any regulatory reform uh, of any significance. Um, and I'll, in the book, I try to outline uh, some of the things that, that need to be done uh, in the area of regulation. Uh, obviously, uh, one of the things you need to begin with uh, is transparency, which is another word for information. You can't have a well-functioning economy when people are hiding what's going on. Uh, the banks were very creative, innovative, in figuring out what I call creative or deceptive accounting, depending on how, what you want to label it as. Uh, they were very good at that. Uh, and they've succeeded, as I said before, in, in 
keeping uh, information, uh, keeping what's going on uh, in a non-transparent way. That has to be changed. But by the way, just to, uh, as a, a parenthesis here, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, is not uh, is is part of the problem. Um, the Federal Reserve is a, a public body, or should be. Uh, in the aftermath of Nixon Watergate, we passed a very important law called the Freedom of Information Act, uh, which says that citizens have the right to know what government does. Uh, they are supposed to be working for us, uh, not we for them. Uh, but the Federal Reserve claims to be above the law. Um, we wanted to know where that money went, where the $180 billion to AIG went. They, they, they refused to tell us. Um, eventually, we found out why, and we found out, and we found out why they didn't want us to know. Uh, the largest single chunk, $13 billion, went to uh, Goldman Sachs. Um, but uh, there are lots of other uh, uh, money that has gone out, and people want to know where it's gone. Well, Bloomberg had to sue to find out where where the money was going. It said that you are a public organ subject to the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, Bloomberg won the case in court. And what was the Federal Reserve's response to turn over the information? No. It was to say, we're still above the law, we're going to challenge you in court, and they've now appealed. So um, the, 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 this uh, lack of transparency is not only in the private sector, there are parts of the public sector that are also uh, have a problem. Uh, economists begin by talking about incentives. And uh, unless we change incentives, we aren't going to change behavior. Uh, and so we need to change incentives at the individual level. I mentioned that before, but also at the organizational level. And that's why the too big to fail bank is such an important concept. If you're too big to fail, it's a one-sided bet. If you bet and win, you walk off with the profits. If you bet and lose, the taxpayer picks up the tab, as we've seen. And that's why breaking up the too big to fail banks is such a uh, key uh, reform. It won't solve all the problems. And some people have made a criticism and say, well, there are other problems. Yes, there are other problems. But if you don't solve this problem, uh, you are almost surely going to have a problem, uh, uh, another kind of crisis down the road. Uh, I don't think we will ever be effective enough in breaking up the too big to fail banks. And that's why I think we need to go beyond that. We have to curtail excessive risk taking. Um, we have to curtail both the behaviors and the products. So we need to do something about the credit default swaps. I've mentioned those several times. Um, we have to do something about excessive leverage. Um, these are just some of the elements that I describe more, more fully in the book that need to be done. Some very elementary principles, actually, that are uh, absolutely essential if we are going to uh, feel any confidence that we're not going to have a recurrence of a crisis such as this again. Let me just conclude by uh, a few, uh, uh, making uh, a couple of uh, final observations. The first is, uh, this is a global crisis. Uh, uh, it has a Made in USA label on it, but uh, we, we exported our toxic war mortgages and we've now exported our recession. Uh, and uh, it, in Europe, things are even more, in some sense, depressed uh, than in the United States in the following sense. Uh, after uh, the countries like Greece, Spain, uh, Portugal bailed out their banks and, and uh, had to bail out the economy to keep it going uh, because of the recession created the financial market, uh, you might have thought that financial markets might have said, oh, we're sorry, and thank you for saving us. But that's not the response that they've had in the United States or in Europe, and Europe has been even worse. They said, we're going to attack you for having too big of a deficit that you created to save us. <laughs> and so Greece, Spain, and Portugal uh, have been under attack. Uh, and the result of that is the interest rates are going uh, uh, sky high, uh, and uh, 
it's it's uh, 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 what what is uh, uh, response that the financial markets have demanded is that we can't cut our bonuses because that would uh, destroy our incentives. But you have to cut the wages of workers, uh, including wages of, of public employees, by about 25 percent. Um, and you have to understand that the wages in, in a country like Greece are not very high. Uh, the, the head of the postal banking system, gets, uh, uh, which is a public financial institution, uh, gets paid about $3,000 a month. Now, I don't call that exorbitant. Uh, and yet those are the kinds of people that, that are being told they have to cut in order for, uh, as a result of the, of the financial uh, crisis. Um, and that is, brings me to the, the, the final point that I, I, I want to raise. Um, we've been focusing a lot on uh, the financial crisis. But meanwhile, there are a whole set of other problems facing uh, the country, uh, facing the world. Uh, problems of global warming, uh, problems of adjusting to changing global comparative advantages, problems of demogra demography, our health care system, our energy sector. Uh, these problems haven't gone away, but the resources that we have have been greatly, to deal with these problems, have been greatly diminished. Uh, and uh, that was one of the reasons I was so concerned about the uh, way in which the bailout was handled, because, uh, because we got cheated so badly, our, our national debt uh, is larger than it otherwise uh, would have been. Uh, finally, in addressing these challenges, both the problem of the crisis and the long-run problems to which I've, I've just referred, uh, we have to be careful not to succumb to the same kind of ideology that brought us to the crisis or to the same kind of short-sighted behavior that brought us to the crisis. It was a sort of a, a, a notion that free markets by themselves could solve all these problems and that, therefore, there was no need for government. Now, you know, anybody who's lived through the last decade knows that governments often make mistakes. Uh, so this is not a question of government uh, being perfect and solving the private sector's problem. But what we know is that private sector alone can't solve the problem. The government sector can't solve the problem. We need a better balance of the market and the, uh, and the government, uh, one that's not driven by, by ideology, but actually driven in many ways by, by the results of economic theory over the last uh, 50 years that have highlighted both the limitations of markets and the limitations of government. Uh, and so uh, in the hope that uh, 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 the younger generation, particularly who are not wedded to these particular ideologies, get this message is one of the real reasons I, I wrote this book. Thank you. So there, there's time for questions, and there are microphones here. Oh, there, there's a microphone so, so people can hear. So, uh, and, uh, I, I know I'm not supposed to say this. She's supposed to say this, but I'll say it for her. Try to keep your questions short. Uh, uh, don't make speeches, because there's a long line, and uh, et cetera. OK. Yes, sir. So much of what you said is no-brainersville as far as I'm concerned. I was disappointed that you referred to liar loans but didn't use the word fraud to describe the broader process because that, as I understand, is what went on systematically for five years, ten years, maybe more. And it is so disturbing to me to see those who enabled this systematic fraud Greenspan was in office for the better part of 20 years. Bernanke has been reappointed. Various other of the foxes who were supposedly guarding the chicken coop are still have various positions in po of power. Volcker was on TV the other day to the effect of that he's never seen the political system so dysfunctional. Why should we have any confidence whatsoever 
that this political system is anything other than what Senator Durbin described it when he talked about the Senate being owned by the banks. He said they're the most powerful lobby in D.C. They own the place. Why should we be any, at all confident that there's going to be any other result than the continuing trashing of the middle class and enrichment of those who really control the government? Well, uh, I, I'm very much in agreement with you that, there, there, that, that these problems are, are not only deep, but in many ways may be getting deeper as a result of the United Citizens case, where uh, the, the uh, uh, restrictions on corporate uh, uh, campaign contributions were, were lifted. Uh, and all I can say uh, on, the, on the broader issue is uh, and something that I emphasize in my book, uh, we aren't going to solve these problems really until we have the political reforms, including campaign reform, that will change uh, the situation from the one where you can say we have the best government you can buy uh, to, to a, one that is more democratically accountable. So I'm very sympathetic. Let me just make one comment on the fraud issue. Uh, because I think it is important, but I, I, I think you one should understand. Um, these problems would have occurred even without fraud. Uh, fraud has exacerbated the problems, and uh, um, there is an interesting, for those of you who follow this, there's a very interesting FBI uh, website on, on uh, tracking the level of fraud. And it's gone up enormously, and they've identified a lot of it. Uh, uh, but uh, it's only part of what is going on. The other point I think the, the issue of fraud raises and it is a very, uh, uh, a very interesting one, which is uh, everybody understands, for instance, that Bernie Madoff went over the line. Uh, what about Goldman? Uh, and the point I was going to say is, is uh, that there are many things, many uh, instances that were uh, with better lawyers who step within the line where the line isn't very clear. Uh, and, you know, examples are uh, uh, the Goldman Sachs uh, actions where they are both selling a product to somebody and selling a short. That was perfectly legal, but it's one that I think most of us would say is, by its very nature, very deceptive. Uh, normally, when you sell a product, you would say, I stand behind it. Um, and I, you can be, bet that they didn't disclose to the people that they were selling the product that, by the way, we have so much confidence in the product that we're selling you, that we're selling it short. How could, if I can follow up, how could it have been? No, I think, I think, I think we... <laughs> Hi, I'm interested in hearing more about incentives and um, if banks and everyone in the financial sector was... Uh, reacting in the same way to the same incentives. How can you explain on the politician side uh, how different politicians reacting differently to the same situation and how can we shape incentives for politicians to behave in a different or more consistent way? Well, I mean, part of the reason, you know, Keynes was very clear in his discussion that uh, interests are important, but so are ideas. And there are some people who felt, who, some politicians, who really are genuinely concerned with the public interest. Many politicians also are genuinely concerned with getting reelected. And uh, there are two aspects of getting reelected, getting the money, and the other one is getting the votes. Uh, hopefully, those two are aligned. But right now, we're in a very interesting situation where those two are not very well aligned. And several of the senators uh, and Congress people who've traditionally uh, been very close to the financial sector are now feeling very queasy about that and, and are, are uh, um, uh, reassessing their positions on a whole variety of reform bills. And you see that in the, in the, in the uh, uh, changes in the, economic, in the positions on a whole variety of regulatory issues uh, that have been happening in Congress in the last year. Hello. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you thought that uh, unemployment was going to um, remain abnormally high for probably the next five years, and a lot of people are saying that one way to cure that is through lower taxes and provide incentives to employers and so forth. Uh, what is your opinion on that? And the other uh, two quick questions are, uh, what would you uh, think would be uh, 
uh, Schumpeter, Hayek's, and Friedman's opinion of Barack Obama's uh, policies in handling this crisis. <laughs> and then the other is more of a comment. Uh, people like John Paulson, who I'm sure you know, uh, detected the flaw in the models and were able to capitalize on that. You asked too many questions at one time. Give me... ta ta how, how do you, you uh, said that you thought that unemployment was going oh, to be okay, normally high? For... Sure. Let me, let me first explain why I th I'm so pessimistic about the uh, uh, quick recovery. Um, what had sustained the American economy and to a large extent the global economy for the years before the crisis was, the, was this bubble. Uh, Americans were taking out uh, literally hundreds of billions of dollars out of their housing uh, for consumption. And the savings rate in the United States went down to zero. Uh, the savings rate is now already up to about four and a half, five percent. Uh, if it returns to the uh, historical average, that would be seven percent. But because of the depletion of uh, wealth, um, there's a reason some people think we'll go beyond that. The implication of this is it's very, very understandable from the point of view of the households, but when people are saving, they're not spending, and that's why uh, it is likely that we will not have a robust uh, recovery anytime soon. Right now, government spending has come in to fill the hole in the private uh, spending, but uh, that's only temporary. Uh, and beginning uh, in 2011, that government support is going to be withdrawn. Meanwhile, um, stakes are going to be contracting because their revenue is going down. They have a balanced budget framework, so when their revenue goes down, they have to cut back spending or raise taxes, and so it's a negative stimulus. And that's part of the reason why most people think that 2011 will actually be weaker than the current year unless we do something quite strong. Uh, what we obviously need is a second round of stimulus, one that is more focused on job creation. One of the aspects of that would be aid to stakes to make up for the shortfall of revenue caused not by any mistake on their part, but by the weak uh, economy. Let me... Um, uh, switch to uh, the last question you made about uh, why is it that Paulson made a lot of money on the one hand and so many other people lost money? Well, part of the issue here goes back to incentives at the individual level. Uh, the individuals in the banks walked off with a lot of money. The banks may have gone bankrupt. But the, in the case of Lehman Brothers, but the guys who were, who were uh, uh, doing the securitization, they wound up with a lot of money. So that's part of the problem here is in some sense the incentive structures are very short term uh, and uh, do not, there's, a, uh, the, the, there, there's not a coincidence between the incentives of the uh, uh, individual banker and the shareholders and the bondholders. And that's real, one of the real problems of modern capitalism. Um, one other aspect of quite interesting uh, uh, about uh, what Paulson did, uh, he saw very clearly that there was a bubble and that there was going to be big losses. And uh, he uh, sold it short. Uh, and other people sold some of the other banks, uh, sold the banks uh, short. What are the, the, the bank's response to this was very interesting because uh, in every other context, they're all in favor of markets uh, and undisciplined, unfettered markets. But suddenly, when the market was selling their stock short, reflecting information that they were actually in trouble, the bank's response was to go to Washington and say, Two changes, don't allow the short selling against us and change the rule, counting rules so that no one can find out how bad we off we are. Uh, this is the confidence that they had in uh, market processes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Claude Weiler from my house resident. Uh, I've been struck recently, especially after the Massachusetts election and what's being said that independents have massively started deserting uh, the Democrats, as it were. How do you get the general public to understand that 
what we are facing is a long-term problem with no quick fixes. Yeah, that's uh, a, a, a difficult question of, of, of politics. Uh, I, I think um, one of the difficulties that Obama faces in particular that's cost him a great deal is the confusion between the stimulus program on the one hand and the bank bailout on the other. Uh, the stimulus program worked. It was too small. Uh, but uh, the bank bailout did not work in the way that it was supposed. It was supposed to reignite Kindle, uh, re and was very costly. Uh, the other problem, uh, reason why he's having such difficulty, I think in part, is uh, this notion that economists use uh, called the counterfactual. What would have been the case? And the problem is they see... Since the stimulus was adopted, unemployment rate went up. And they don't understand is that the mistakes that had occurred under the previous administration were the reason that it was going up. And you have to ask what it would have been were it not for the stimulus. And that's why I say it would have been probably around 12%. The stimulus did bring it down. But what people see is not what it would have been. They see what it was and where it is. And that's really explaining this notion of counterfactual is, is one of the hard concepts that, that, uh, that has to be explained. So, so you don't see any good way of getting the, the general public there, to... There's no easy way, no. But I've written the book partly to hope, hopefully get, make a, a little dent on, uh, on that. I, I wonder what you think of uh, an alternative to re-regulation of the form, in the form of holding the banks to the bet that they made, having perhaps an aggregator bank or uh, the TARP buying the mortgage-backed securities valued at what the people living in the homes can actually pay and then modifying the mortgages accordingly. So in principle, nobody would have to be foreclosed on. Uh, I could say this as an alternative because, oh, and of course, uh, the insolvent banks would have to be auctioned off at their true value to new owners. Uh, I say this is an alternative because now there is a great fervor for regulation, but by the time the next bubble comes, that will all be gone. So what really counts is how the moral hazard issue is addressed right now and uh, marking yep. uh, the mortgage-backed securities to what would be their market value based on what home livers, homeowners could pay um, yep. and recapitalizing them. Let me just say that there are a number of alternatives. I do think that um, uh, we do have to do the regulation, uh, but we also have to deal with the mortgages. My, uh, the proposal that I talk about in the book that I like is what I call a homeowner's chapter 11, which has some uh, similarity to what uh, I think you've just described, which says that uh, anybody who can't uh, repay, uh, ordinary chapter 11, for those of you who don't know, is a firm that can't pay what it, what, what it owes goes into court, and what they do is they uh, shareholders lose everything. The uh, bondholders become the new shareholders, and you write down the, the level of debt. And this would be my homeowner's chapter 11 would be something very similar to that, uh, and uh, it would reflect the correct market value, which was not the bubble value that we had uh, a few uh, years ago. Uh, in one way or another, I do not think we will emerge from the crisis until, unless and until we deal with the problem of, of uh, these mortgages that are underwater, um, and at least a substantial fraction of them. Uh, two questions, very concrete. No, one. Only one, because I think... Uh, it's very yeah. short. It's very short. Very short. I'm going to be very, please don't let me talk so much, just very short. <laughs> Number one, in your opinion, what, are China's, uh, what is China's prospective bubble in the banking sector in the short and medium run? And number two, what, in your opinion, what is the effect of the partisanship in the U.S. Congress on the recovery of the American economy? Well, uh, the partisanship has been very destructive in the ability to uh, 
formulate a uh, regulatory policy, to formulate an appropriate mortgage policy, to pro formulate a, 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 an adequate stimulus. Uh, just take on the mortgage issue, uh, the uh, uh, Democrats passed in House a, a uh, bill that would have allowed them to begin doing uh, more restructuring, but because uh, they can't get the support in the Senate, uh, the bill is effectively stalled and nothing, uh, nothing is happening. Uh, in China, uh, there are bubble, uh, there are concerns about bubbles in many of the emerging markets, and it's actually related again to a failure uh, in some ways of the Fed policy. Uh, the problem is the following. Uh, the banks have been allowed to borrow at close to zero interest rate uh, from the Fed, uh, but the banks looking around the world say the United States is not the best way to use our, the money that we're getting for almost free from the U.S. government. Uh, so what are they doing? They're not lending in the United States, which is why uh, things are so, so bad. They're looking for the, around the world for the next bubble, like the last two bubbles, the, the, the tech bubble and the housing bubble. And right now, the emerging markets look a lot, a lot better prospects. Some countries, like Brazil, have responded by saying, we don't want all this money. We don't want to have a bubble. We've learned the lesson from, uh, from you. We don't want to go through that same experience. Um, China uh, already has some controls, and, 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 and there is a little bit of a bubble. Two things about uh, China though, is its government keeps a little bit better control of its economy so far. Uh, it has more instruments. Um, and uh, in terms of fraud, it has uh, other ways of uh, penalizing people uh, for uh, bad behavior. Uh, uh, I think we don't want that uh, kind of, uh, uh, but it does have incentive effects. Um, uh, but the second thing is that uh, uh, much of the uh, investment, both in real estate and the stock market uh, in China, uh, is not debt financed. Uh, people in China are saving, uh, the China's savings rate is 50%. Um, and so it's, uh, it, 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 debt financed bubbles are the ones that are particularly dangerous because when they break, they lead to this overhang of debt. Uh, and uh, the, the destruction of firms and, um, and all kinds of further problems. Thank you. Um, my name is Bill Kovacs. I'm a 64-year-old investment lawyer. I've written literally hundreds of securitizations and thousands of credit default swaps. I'm sure you know that until the last 10, 15 years, the computational power didn't even exist to compute the swap book that a house like Lehman was running. And I'm very familiar with the reform proposals. My observation is that both the economists and the people working on the proposals do not address the role of technology in creating the products that led to the crisis. It seems to me the assumption is if a computer algorithm can be written to do something, then it should be allowed. Would you comment on that? Yeah, I, I, I agree with you uh, a, a lot. In fact, one of the metaphors I use is that, in fact, uh, to a large extent, uh, inside the financial sector, there was a new form of Goss plan. Uh, it was uh, a judgment of value not based on, uh, based on computers doing a calculation that no person could really fathom, and therefore no person could really judge the reasonableness of it. And uh, that was particularly true, as I say, the, the, the area where people have really understood this is uh, in the valuation of the securities, because the securities were based on, on these complicated models and uh, with millions of separate uh, 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 mortgages going into them. No person could sit down and, and do, do those calculations. And uh, they required a, a whole variety of technical, probabilistic assumptions. And uh, many of those assumptions were flawed. I, I talked about the data that went into that. Uh, but the underlying models they were using were also flawed. A standard model used log-normal distributions. Um, 
and uh, the characteristic of that is that the pro failures happen much more seldom than, in fact, is the case. Uh, and they they should have known about uh, that there were the models were wrong. Um, there are some people who have used calcul you know said that the the um, the, according to the model, the kind of crisis that we had in 1987 would have happened once uh, in the life of the universe. And then we had another crisis in 1998 uh, with long-term capital management, and now we've had a third crisis. So we've had three crises in about 30 years uh, that should have happened once in a life or uh, a life of one or two universes. That tells you something's wrong uh, with 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 the models uh, that are being used. But your question raises, a, there's a deeper question I think I, I want to just reflect yeah, on. The deeper uh, question is, can you regulate technology if you're talking about the world of ideas? Yeah. Uh, what I was going to comment on, on one other aspect of that, which is the people making the decisions of these, like the heads of Citibank, don't understand the, the a clueless <laughs> about that. And the question is, how can they make a judgment about what is reasonable or is not, what is a good model or not. And that is, I think, a deep problem in, in, in uh, 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 this. Whether we, you know, I think we can regulate complexity. Uh, we can regulate some of these products and talk about how complex they can be. We could actually regulate the extent to, you know, uh, one of the, one of the uh, provisions in the House bill is the creation of a Financial Product Safety Commission. And one of the intent of that is to be able to make assessments about whether, in fact, these products are so complex that they shouldn't be marketed. Uh, and some countries, um, uh, the Central Bank of, of one of the Asian countries uh, uh, told me that when uh, uh, some of the Wall Street firms came in asking for permission to sell the CDSs in uh, her country. Uh, she said, uh, explain it to me. And uh, they couldn't. She said, well, then you can't sell them here. <laughs> so that may be one solution. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Um, I was wondering if this was a zero-sum situation. You mentioned that the, the demographic inconsistencies in poverty and unemployment, even in the crisis today, and I was wondering how much of the economic bubble growth was based on the exacerbation of that inequality. And do you think that now when everyone's kind of down and um, even still with some worse than others, as you said, that this is the best time to establish some type of equality or is inequality inevitable um, in the system where, like you said, self-interest is synonymous with greed? Yeah, uh, inequality uh, has played a role in, in the creation of the crisis. Uh, again, something I talk about, and it was actually something emphasized. I chaired a, a UN commission on reform of the economic, uh, the monetary and financial system, and they emphasized it perhaps even more. Uh, and the reason is the following. Uh, I mentioned before what, what the reason the economy is weak is that there's a lack of aggregate demand, a lack of demand that keeps the economy going. Um, one of the reasons that there's a weak aggregate demand is that we've been redistributing money from people at the bottom who expend, spend it to people at the top who don't spend it all. Uh, and that leads to a, a weaker aggregate demand. What kept the economy going for a while was that as inequality was growing, we told the people whose income was declining, don't let it bother you. Uh, you know, keep spending as if your income was going up. Uh, and they did a very good job at that. Uh, but if your spending is going up and your income is going down, how is that possible? Right. Debt. What made this work was that house prices were going up and there was this fiction that, in fact, they were growing wealthier even as they were growing more in debt. But we now realize that that was a fiction. We can't go back to that world. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm uh, very pessimistic about a quick recovery. Now, would this be a good time for uh, trying to get more progressive taxation uh, and other policies that would uh, uh, change the distribution of income and that would help uh, strengthen aggregate demand? I think, yes, I've, I've actually argued that uh, tax reforms that are more progressive could actually be part of 
you know, so raising the taxes towards the top and lowering it towards the bottom, increasing taxes on speculation. I mean, can you imagine a society that taxes speculation lower at a lower rate than people who work for a living? You know, what, what kind of a message does that set, uh, send? So those are some tax reforms that would do something a little bit uh, about the distribution of income. Uh, unfortunately, we've all been talking about the difficulty of getting uh, uh, little reforms like uh, uh, bank reforms, doing something about too big to fail banks that, that everybody agree are a problem. Uh, uh, I'm not optimistic that we're going to be able to do something about those issues right now. Okay. Um, quick, very literally quickly. Um, you said unemployment. Oh, can I ask it? <laughs> It's for a friend, it's not for me. Thank you for your talk. Um, you very eloquently described how you know, the banks you know, turned on the spigot of credit and f to serve these speculative real estate uh, values. Could you also speak to what creates those, those values? And as the formulator of the Henry George theorem, which deals with why you know, land prices inflate, could you kind of explain or could you speak to how some of Henry George's solutions might kind of uh, serve to short circuit that cycle and avert the speculation in the first place? Uh, well, that, that's a really hard question. I mean, for those of you who don't know, Henry George was one of the great economists at the end of the uh, 19th century, a very progressive uh, person. And he argued that uh, we ought to be taxing uh, he was sensitive to the issue of distortionary taxes, and he said, well, what is the one thing that we can tax uh, that uh, has a, uh, an elastic supply that won't go away? Well, tax land, because if you tax land, the land can't say, well, I'm not happy about being taxed. I'm going to disappear. There it is. Well, not quite true, because uh, as you know, you create land in, in uh, Lake Michigan here. So land is partly created, but most land is is uh, uh, natural. Uh, and modern versions of Henry George theorem say that we ought to be taxing the rents on not only land, but also on oil, natural resources. Uh, and uh, if we did that, we would actually uh, need to tax uh, savings and late work much less. Uh, it's a much more efficient uh, form of taxation, and I, and I agree with that. It's basically a taxation on speculation, like you said. Yeah, that's right. So uh, the, 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 well, there's another principle of taxation, which is it makes more sense to tax bad things than tax good things. And speculation, uh, especially the kind of speculation that we're seeing in Greece, uh, uh, actually contributes to economic instability and, and imposes costs on others. And so that's another example of, of a tax structure that actually uh, can contribute to, to, to general well-being at the same time that it generates revenue. Thank you. Uh, you emphasized uh, during the talk uh, a narrative of the crisis based on market failures, on deregulation, and unfettered capitalism. However, throughout the talk, you also mentioned flawed monetary policies, regulatory capture, special interests, uh, a flawed institutional framework, and all the, those seem to suggest an alternative uh, narrative based on government failure rather than market failure. So my question is, uh, how can we have any confidence that all these political economy problems will not completely pollute and, uh, and ruin any regulatory reform? How can we have any confidence that regulatory reform can ever succeed? Well, uh, 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 the, there, there is no way you can have confidence that regulatory reform will succeed, as, as we know. But, we have experience in the past of a successful regulatory regime that worked for over 30 years. The world changed and we needed a new regulatory form. So the notion that you can't, you know, that we've not had, uh, that, that uh, as I said in my talk, uh, we can't expect a perfect regulatory regime. Uh, but we can certainly get a better regulatory regime. And part of the struggle right now, part of the discussion, uh, and we may not succeed in the end, is uh, what kinds of regulatory institutions are least likely to be captured. 
And part of the fight right now is that those who uh, don't want regulation don't want the creation of institutions that would not be captured. So one of the, one of the important institutions that people are talking about, I mentioned very briefly, is the Financial Product Safety Commission. The reason that's so important is it would be, it would have on it people who would lose if dangerous products would be produced. Not just people from the financial sector that's producing the products, but the users, the people who are the consuming uh, of these products. Um, and so a change in the regulatory structure of that kind, getting other voices, is likely to have uh, different outcomes. Um, so uh, what we do know is that unfettered markets lead to problems. And we do know that some regulations in the past have succeeded in curbing the worst practices. Uh, and uh, so the question is, are there mild regulations of the kind I've described? And these are not very strict regulations. Uh, antitrust laws are, you know, are, are examples of regulations that even most uh, uh, Adam Smith talked about the, the dangers of, of, uh, uh, of uh, non-competitive behavior. So any, any economy has rules that have to, uh, you, you cannot have an economy without rules. And what we're talking about are what are the appropriate rules? And uh, we're in the struggle to try to get the right rules. So um, at the same time that this uh, period of the last 30, 40 years created this mess now that we're seeing it also helped to boost, uh, to help a lot of countries and people in, in, in developing countries to get out of poverty. So how would you go about solving, uh, creating this new framework of, of regulatory uh, uh, laws uh, so that you would not prevent, or how, what do you think are the chances and how would you prevent that the globalization, its developed world discontents would adversely affect globalization and its uh, content uh, developing countries uh, adversely. How would you go about doing that? Well, um, you know, the general, let me first talk about the general issue is, uh, that you're raising is uh, how worried should we be that as we go about adopting regulations that protect us against uh, the, the kinds of instability, the kinds of uh, bad behavior that we've seen, uh, should, should we worry about uh, that interfering with our ability to get some of the positive things, like innovation, uh, like uh, the flow of capital to developing countries that can help uh, uh, increase their income? Well, my view is uh, this in two parts. Uh, first, uh, let me take first the issue of innovation. Um, most of the financial innovation that we've seen in the last uh, 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 10, 15 years has not increased the performance of our economy. You know, Paul Volcker put it, I think, very forcefully. He said, you know, he, he wished he could find somebody who was not in the industry that could give a shred of evidence that, it, uh, that this financial innovation, so-called financial innovation, had had any positive effect on our economy. And, and I, I think I agree with him. It's very hard to find any evidence. Uh, but the reason, if you have the right regulatory framework, you would channel the creative energy away from the way it's been doing creative accounting that's deceptive, intended to arbitrage, uh, taxation, regulation, uh, uh, and so forth, and channel that creative energy to ways that would be more creative. Now, one of the ways that's more creative is how do we handle the risk of the developing countries? Uh, I mentioned the fact that uh, our financial sector did a terrible job on developing new products to help people manage the risk of home ownership, their most important asset. There are innovations out there, like the Danish mortgage bond, that would have done a lot better. But our financial markets resisted a lot of these innovations, and I saw it very clearly when I was uh, on the Council of Economic Advisors, where we tried to come up with some innovations like uh, uh, an inflation index bond to protect people against the risk of inflation. They resisted that. They didn't want us to do that. Why? Because they were interested in transaction costs, fees, and people who bought these inflation index bonds bought them and held them, and if you buy and held, hold, you don't make money. They don't make money. From the point of view of retirees, it's exactly what we wanted. Well, 
another big risk that they have not managed well is the risk of developing countries. Developing countries have been left to bear a lot risk of uh, exchange rate volatility, interest rate volatility. Um, one of the reasons why over and over again, uh, developing countries have had debt crises. Uh, and why- It seems you have changed now, no? What? It seems to be the opposite now. Uh, I don't know if it should be opposite. It should be. Uh, what, what I'm trying to say is that the financial sector has not solved this problem, and if we get better regulatory frameworks and understand why it has failed so often, we can use that creative energy to reduce these kinds of risk and make sure that more of the money actually goes to enhancing the well-being and the stability of the developing countries rather than creating these recurrent debt crises that have marked uh, the last... Uh, 30 years, and that have required government bailouts time and time again. Thank you. The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a collaborative project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies and the International House Global Voices Program. The World Beyond the Headlines series aims to bring scholars and journalists together to consider international news stories and how these stories are covered. As a listener, you have come to rely on this program for in-depth analysis of major issues facing our country and our world. But we can only continue our nationally recognized coverage with support from you. Secure the future of World Beyond the Headlines programming by making your gift online at alumniservices.uchicago.edu slash giving. Please specify World Beyond the Headlines as the area of giving. The World Beyond the Headlines series is supported by the McCormick Foundation, the Norman Wade Harris Fund, and from generous contributions from listeners like you.